Star Parker at NRB 2021. Getting ready to go in the exhibit hall. Cure Policy is here. We're live. We've uh, got all of our team here. This is where we come to grow, to learn how to podcast, how to fundraise, how to uh, build network. Our pastors are here as well. Uh, thanks to some sponsors, special sponsors that brought several of our pastors in so that we can start discussing how to build that network of the 500, connecting them so that we can get into these distressed zip codes and get them fixed. We want to change the law so we can change lives and we're really excited getting ready to go into the exhibit hall where thousands of other like-minded Christian communicators are we're going to uh, learn from them grow from them see their booths get all types of information from them and we're going to be bringing a whole lot of this to you on Cure America with Star Parker you'll see some interviews that are spectacular our coffee croissants and conversation we're now uh, going to our own booth in the exhibit hall and between that many of the staff are going to different classes so that they can learn uh, how to develop their skills to better serve you Welcome to Cure America. I'm Star Parker, and we are live at NRB, the National Religious Broadcasters Annual Convention. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with NRB, it is an umbrella association for Christian communicators around the world. So anyone that is trying to preach the gospel, push the gospel out, whether it's in radio, television, print, I mean, you have the underground church here, all types uh, come here annually. Uh, more than 2,000 today are here in Dallas. Others are streaming online. And we are here with our pastors. And for the first time, uh, Urban Cure is one of the sponsors. So we decided to have a morning coffee croissant and conversation about some of the issues that we address in the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. So I hope that you will enjoy this hour of Cure America as we move around the NRB convention, grabbing everyone in sight to see what they're doing here and how we can bring that experience to you. I have as my special guest this morning at our coffee, one of the pastors that you've met before. He's actually uh, been on Cure America, Pastor LaFleur. Uh, Cesar LaFleur is one of our stellar pastors who has served us greatly across the country, works very closely with Reverend Tim Latino who you'll meet later. You've already met Tim, but you're going to talk to him later. You're going to hear him later uh, when we in, during the show. But for right now, he is a, allowing us to experience some of his pastors. Every day we will be doing a different pastor, having some conversation with them, and we're going to put it together. Ariel's going to put it together for you uh, to watch in one hour. So we appreciate that, and we appreciate you, Pastor, uh, coming from Chicago and also serving around the country, but mostly in Chicago, because you've always had a heart. We've been there a hundred times with you, uh, including in South Chicago. We've done Cure Chicago on several occasions, and I will never forget the one younger, older woman who came up to us at the end and had the microphone, and she said, you know, I've been in this neighborhood all my life. She said, I remember walking at night down to the corner store. Now I wouldn't even walk to the corner uh, in the daytime, and the store isn't there. Something has changed, and Chicago. So I'm glad that you're the first with us because as the country is now uh, discussing uh, all types of race matters and as the left is pushing out their agenda of progressivism, I think it's important that we as Christians make our voice heard. So thank you for joining with me it's this morning. It's my pleasure. I'm happy okay. to be here. So, so tell me tell me about, um, uh, let, let them know who you are a little bit and about the organization you're working with because now you're even over at the Family Institute trying to help. Um, in fact, they're one of our sponsors. Absolutely. We do need to mention them. You're so talk a little bit about who they are to have sponsored several of our pastors and the wives to come here to NRB here in Dallas to get fed some information that they might not be exposed to on a regular basis. Well, absolutely. I've been in Chicago. I've been ministering in Chicago for over 30 years, uh, born and raised on the south side of Chicago. I was educated there, raised my family there. I've seen the changes because of uh, sin and for the declining of the family and all those other things that are having devastating effects on our city. So my heart is for Chicago. My heart is for our nation, but my heart is for my city. Uh, right now I'm working with the Illinois Family Institute. I'm over the um, public school exit project because we oh, believe public that public school exit absolutely we're leaving the public schools leave getting, I love getting your children i love we, our new sponsor very, oh, <laughs> that laughter we have a live audience which we don't normally have on cure america but there's a live audience here so if you hear folks it's not like one of those soundtracks but tell me a little more i want to hear about, yeah, about this. our message is time to get your children out of public schools if you are a christian family you must get your children out of public schools because what's happening in them is not education it's indoctrination we have people with a worldview that's antithetical to our christian faith 
and they want to indoctrinate our children. So we must rescue our children by getting our children out. And we're trying to show pastors and parents that you can do it. You have the ability to be able to take responsibility for your children's education because the Bible says it is your responsibility to teach your children the principles of God, the righteousness principles of God, to make sure they get wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And so what they're being provided for now is indoctrination into some belief systems that we don't want to take part of because we see what the end result of those are. They're teaching our children critical race theory in our schools. Uh, this comprehensive sexual education where they're sexualizing our children. Hear me clearly. They are sexualizing your children in school. And, and not in, just in school, in kindergarten. Absolutely. They're starting absolutely. very young. Mm -hmm. Now this didn't start overnight, Pastor, and I think that a whole lot of Christians were shocked uh, when their kids were thrown out of these government funded union controlled cesspools we call schools to see what was in that curriculum once they got the child home and they started looking at uh, what they were learning is this that window of opportunity to make this message heard not just for the folks in Chicago because it seems like in the poor communities they get it worse you know they they're the ones that that they've been experimenting all of these ideas on and now the general population is seeing more of what has been happening over years inside of these government funded union controlled cesspools we call schools so what is this that moment is this when there's just no more excuse for parents to, to, to come up with to say, but I've got to go to church on Sunday and then turn my kid over to a secular pagan society on Monday. I believe this is one of those Kairos moments, one of the moments that God is sending forth to really have an opportunity to, to make a move. Uh, absolutely the movement is out there. People are getting the information and people are being shocked by what they're discovering. My daughter is a school teacher. And when she discovered some of the things that had been brought in under the cover of darkness, she was shocked. And she said, dad, I can't believe this is what they want us to do. This is what they want us to teach. Some of the material is so pornographic that they could not even show it to U.S. senators and congressmen on the floor of the house because it was just too vulgar. But yet they're showing that to your children, to, to first graders children, and second graders. Gardeners, first, first grade, grade, second grade. And Absolutely. then there's a movement in Washington that now they want to take it even further and say, well, we want to provide you child care. We're going to do a womb to tomb. Mm -hmm. We're going to get them younger because you guys are, in fact, they're even saying you're putting racism in them at one years old. Mm -hmm. So that's why we as a society have to have them. Absolutely. But every time they talk about racism, the LGBTQ is right there too. I don't see an R in that, but it's R LGBTQ mm -hmm. and they mix it all together. So what? tell us about the project of family, um, the, the institute that you're with. Illinois Family Institute, but I'm sure that other states have these institutes that they can get information, or maybe you guys even have a website that they Absolutely. can get information to get Our their children out of these schools. It's IllinoisFamily.org, IllinoisFamily.org, and you can hit backslash public school exit, and it would take you to a website that would give you information about Illinois Family and also about the public school exit project. And I just want to say, when you talked about getting your children early, I always hear them say they want to have early childhood uh, care, they want to have early childhood development, but it's not because they are concerned about your child. They just want to get them earlier so they can start the indoctrination process earlier. I'd say sometimes they believe in train up a child in the way it should go more than the people of faith do because they really adhere to that. They say that if we can get them early and we give our children if to they them. They even let them be born. First right, of all, absolutely. we want to kill them in the womb. And so then we, if they don't get to kill them in the womb, then we're okay. Then we, we, we have to decide who they're going to be. And this be. is why they're going to do it. We give our children to them for 15,000 hours. And then we have them for maybe an hour on Sunday school as if that's not enough. And if it's not happening in the homes where you're teaching them these principles of the faith, you know, if it's not happening there, where do you think they're going to get it? They're definitely not going to get it in the school system. Uh, Vody Wacom said you can't keep sending your children to Caesar for their education and then act surprised when they come home as Romans. And that's exactly what we're <laughs> He's doing. He's actually here at NRB. In fact, he'll be speaking later, and I'm going to try to catch an interview with Absolutely. him as well. I think that there might be some questions in the audience. So we have a microphone if somebody wants to ask a couple of questions of Pastor LaFleur, because you can see the excitement uh, of getting it's our window of opportunity we had during COVID not many noticed that we had an amazing victory at the Supreme Court when it comes to educational options for money to follow children to schools parents want it's called the Espinosa decision so they said that it is no longer it's not unconstitutional to send your children to schools including 
Christian schools. We have no excuse anymore. So I'm just very excited to hear about this project that you're working on. I was going to ask you, and if somebody's going to get up to the mic, then I'll, I'll see them, and then I will answer their question. But I was going to ask you as well about policing, because when you think about Chicago, I mean, you guys have a mayor who seems like a racist herself, that she would say to the public and out loud that um, I only am going to interview with ethnic people, with people of color. We're having some serious discussions right now about how we're going to unify ourselves as a society. We're talking to a Christian community that is as diversified as the heavens above, and yet they keep insisting that we're so racially um, uh, insensitive that now you have mayors. What are the people that are really just struggling to survive thinking about when they hear this out of a political official and what can we do to help bridge those gaps so that you can police in your area people will have respect for police in your area so that a rule of law will be in our poorer communities so that they can begin to thrive well let me say this what we have is the blind leading the blind in many cases and so what we have to pray for is a spiritual awakening in our nation that God would open up the eyes of people uh, absolutely our, our mayor is I remember you said years ago never be surprised what an unregenerated mind will do what an unregenerated mind will come up with we've got to stop being shocked and surprised by what the enemy would do as he works through these people well that's what jeremiah said i don't want to take credit he said yeah. the heart of man is deceitful absolutely. above all and desperately wicked. A absolutely Who can know? you don't know what you're going to do that's why we have to be born Abs again absolutely. and then we got to be born again 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 we right. got to get up every morning and that's the reason that i wanted mm. the churches open because if without that refreshing every week you know sin will as the baptist used to say take you further than you want to go absolutely. keep you longer than than you want to stay and then cost you Absolutely. more than you want to and pay. So, and so as people of faith, we have to stop looking for human solutions to deal with spiritual problems. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening in Chicago and a lot of other cities around the nation is spiritual wickedness. And so the only thing that's going to change that is the spirit of God moving. In Chicago, we deal with this crime situation. We got guns everywhere and, and we have violence and gangs and everything. So the city is in chaos and we're looking for human solutions to be able to solve that. I, I hear them talk about the policing and the gun issue and we're blaming the gun for what's happening in our cities. But a gun is an inanimate object because you set it on the table, it won't bother anybody. If you put it in the hand of God, uh, a fearing law abiding citizens, it's not going to hurt anybody. But when the wicked are running rampant over the city and then you provide them with guns, the problem is not the gun, the problem is the wickedness. The problem is the broken families. The problem is the education system that's producing all of this. Look at the outcome of sin run rampant and not being challenged, which is why the Church of Jesus Christ must step up and be the voice that speaks out we the answers to the problem of the world are in the kingdom of God you know if God doesn't do it it won't get done and God wants to do that through us and so our voices must be heard we must challenge uh, authority by speaking the prophetic voice of God to them you know if I have an opportunity to speak to Mayor Lightfoot and I hope she watches this you know I would tell her listen your path is wrong where you're leading us is wrong you want to lead us down a path of, of, of sexualization and and chaos and you well, want to your children I believe is in in sexual chaos Absolutely. When you start thinking about people that are bought into this lie of LGBTQ. And, that's what and I think that my there. biggest concern, especially in the promotion now, the T part of it, is that they're catching kids right at the puberty age. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to try to convince them that, you know, because you like flowers as a little boy, uh, you might want to become a little girl and and this is going unchallenged so we only have a minute or so left so i want you to uh what can we do what 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 would um you know the the psalmist asks us when the foundations are destroyed what, what will the, the righteous, righteous do? do yes right well the righteous must step up and and do like the, the psalmist did. He, he said in thee O Lord I put my trust before he made that so we have to put our trust in God and we have to operate in the spirit of God and we have to speak truth and one of the things we can't allow the enemy to do is put this shackle of hate around us the Illinois Family Institute is a very God fearing pro family organization yeah. but they have tagged us as being a hate group because we speak up against these things and they speak against you because uh, well those are white people over there you don't want to listen to mm -hmm. them so I'm so glad that you're there pastor because I'm not a know, white they, person I know that <laughs> I might can pass as white sometimes, but I'm not in uh, 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 only, only here. I know. That's why I keep telling people when they try to make me put my, my color in front of Christ. I'm like, okay, not only is Christ in front of my color, but California girl is in front of color, too. So, uh, so it's really good. So, okay, so number one, you're saying, let's just 
speak the truth Absolutely. of Christ mm -hmm. I, I, and, and even the hard part, you know, the right. scripture tells us if you say you haven't sinned, you deceive yourself right. and God's not mm -hmm. with you. In fact, in fact, you call him a liar, uh, according to John. But also you're telling us the second thing is get our kids out of these schools, get rescue them, them, get them out of the public schools right away and find out how you can churches, pastors, look, you have an opportunity because some of us have buildings that said empty all week. Open up a school there. Uh, budget, put a line item on your budget. We spend money in the kingdom of God on some really stupid stuff when we really should be put, spending the money on what's the most important. If we're going to save America, we're going to have any redemption in this country, we're going to have to save the next generation of children. So start schools, support home schools, homeschool co-ops, get your children out of that. And I'll also get involved. There's organizations like Cure that, you know, as far as pastors, you know, we have a network of pastors, over 500 pastors across the country. Uh, we can be the spiritual support of what goes on well, in Washington, D.C. Well, not just there. Mm -hmm. We want to change the law so that we can Absolutely. change the lives. And one of the things that was in the original vision in my heart when I started Cure was every church serving in our distressed zip code should be a school. What we need is money to follow the student. That's right. What we need is for, for, for the legislators to remove the barriers so that people can live free and teach their children in the word of God. So I want to thank you uh, for... Pastor, I got to thank you first. I want to thank you for listening to this particular interview. We're going to continue with our coffee. We have plenty of croissants. We have more conversation that we'll be having. Uh, but for you that are watching, I'll be right back after this message. Let's take a quick history lesson. Just two centuries ago, 94% of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's eight and a half percent. In a century, our life expectancy is more than doubled. How did we come so far so fast? The freedom to create, to start a business, to keep what you earn. Don't let the socialists and radical left cost us our progress, our freedom, and our well-being. It's time we fight for America and vote for America. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., CURE works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. CURE's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. CURE, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. America. I'm Star Parker. Thank you for joining us again. Here we are at NRB. Uh, my goodness, I told you all about NRB already, that it is the world's largest gathering of Christian communicators. And there are thousands of people here doing all types of information collection, uh, networking, learning, growing, listening to incredible worship music, and hearing from most amazing pastors uh, that are serving in their spaces all across the world. And what we've done at Cure uh, is invited some of our pastors to join us so that they can learn and grow as well as our team members at Cure where we learn and grow so that we can better serve you. And so I have with me a very, very special pastor, a pastor that I didn't recognize when I saw him because the only time I've seen him in person before I was actually in an audience, and he gave an incredible uh, admonition, I should say, to a city that he grew up in, went to school, and became a professional football player uh, as a result, and then the city was under attack. There's a city in, uh, in Texas called Alito. A lot of you have never even heard of Alito, but Alito, Texas is attracting those that are in the sports industry. If you have a young man or a young uh, a woman who wants baseball or football, if you get into Alito High, Oh my goodness, you're going to be a professional player. And so not many people know about this, but what happened about, um, well, a few months ago, Alito came under attack. And Alito came under attack because um, a couple of the boys that were playing baseball there, and they were on a baseball team, decided that they were going to make a joke on the internet on their own time, on their own dime, and they got caught because it was a racial joke, and you know, you can't erase the internet, and the next thing you know, Black Lives Matters does what Black Lives Matters does, which is seize the moment to try to further their agenda. So they were descending on Alito. And now I'm in town because as a social policy consultant, I was there speaking in Weatherford uh, on a different matters, but heard all about what was happening in Lido. So I stayed over to not only be a fly on the wall, but to get the truth out about what was really happening there because they were trying to 
just really rip this town apart, declare them as racist, and the hidden agenda is because they have uh, someone running for attorney general that's one of the attorneys that uh, they want to promote and become the next Stacey Abrams and perhaps even uh, the next whatever they do <laughs> to continue their Marxist agenda. Whole lot of people got up, whole lot of people went after the school board, a whole lot of talk that we hear all of the time endlessly now about critical race theory and how important it is, systemic racism, and how bad we all are as American people. And then two people, only two, got up and spoke the word of the Lord. One was an Asian man. He got up and said, I know this town too well. I've lived here, my family's lived here, and everything that you're hearing about how racist we are is not true. And then at the end of the evening, I don't, I, God bless those school board members. They sat through it all, hearing how racist they were and how horrible they were and how they were going to destroy everything in their lives. And then at the end of the evening, the last speaker, my new friend, got up and shared his story. Ryan Newsom, pastor, got up and said, you know what? I know this town. And what you've just heard is not true. He said, I'm going to take off my former football hat and put on my pastor hat. And I'm telling you, the room was stilled. You thought we were in church. And the next thing you know, they had an ovation. And I think that you lit into those school board uh, members a new fire to say, we don't have to bow to Black Lives Matters. We know what we're doing here. And we know what kind of community we have. And we can now move on from this moment. And they did quiet down. Yeah. Maybe. But you know what? You have to tell the truth about some of the things, Pastor, yeah. that you actually walked in one of those Black Lives Matter <laughs> protests. So you got to tell us who you are and how you got to that place. Yeah, thank you so for joining me. Thank you, Star. Uh, can't even believe I'm here, really. It's, it's, been, it's been a crazy journey for me. Um, but, yeah, in short, um, Star really kind of said it all. I think one of the things for me, um, like Star said, I played football for uh, 20 years. I'm only 24, so you do the math. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I have football coursing through my veins. My great uncle's Ozzie Newsom. And so for uh, me, my last name, it carries a lot of weight on its own. Um, and so I uh, grew up in um, Fort Worth, Texas. I went to um, Alito High School uh, my junior and senior year. Uh, won a couple of state titles. Um, Set a couple national records. Uh, tied the national record of most punt returns in high school history, and I have the state record, so I don't think nobody's going to break that anytime soon. <laughs> um, went on to go to uh, the University of Texas. I was there under Charlie Strong, uh, so I was doing a couple years with him and then uh, ended up transferring to uh, Arizona State. And so I was uh, up under uh, Herm Edwards. And so um, two just really good men, uh, learned a lot from those two. Um, and one of the things that I just remember as far as just like my life, somebody always told me, Ryan, if you want to understand God's calling on your life, then you need to le read your life backwards. And so uh, for me, that was kind of just like an interesting dichotomy. But um, when I understood basically that football was basically what I did, but it wasn't who I was, um, I really started to cultivate an identity outside of the game. And so uh, that's hard because as a football player, uh, most oftentimes you have just this group of people that just kind of really pencil you in, whether it's your own family or it's just, um, society in and of itself. They pretty much tell you that's all you can really do. Um, so a lot of those guys in the locker room that I'm with, they're either football players or they're rappers. And for me, I just really kind of saw this, this cannot be – all there is to me, all there is to Ryan. And and so I just started to really learn uh, basically who God was. I grew up a nominal Christian, uh, really didn't understand um, God. I had information about him, but that's not the same as knowing him. And so uh, for me, uh, my whole life, you know, I kind of claimed to be uh, something that I, honestly I really wasn't. Um, I claimed to know Jesus, but yet I was. my heart was very far from him. And uh, so when I got to college, God really kind of became just the center of my life, unbeknownst to me. And what I mean by that is he started to really cleanse me of my idols. And so um, he really kind of stripped me of everything that I really called God. Um, and the gifts that he gave me, uh, the deceptive nature, I feel like, of the enemy is that he doesn't really have an issue with God giving you gifts uh, he just wants those gifts to replace God. And so uh, for me, 
that's exactly, you know, what happened. And so uh, that's kind of my story, you know, how I really kind of came to know the Lord. Me and my now wife broke up in like 2016. I was hurt. I was like, oh, man, like, what are we going to do? Oh, Lord, what am I going to do? Um, and at that moment, I really just kind of understood. I was just talking to the Lord and I was like, man, why, why do I feel like I can't breathe? Um, and so it was more than just a breakup. It was it was an idol that God was breaking me up with. And um, and that along with football um, in 2018, I ended up breaking my foot. So I really couldn't catch a break here. My grandmother died in 2017. And um, the one of the things that I remember with my grandmother, um, ever since I was four years old, she would always call me preacher man. And I ended up actually having uh, 50 scholarship offers in Texas. So I had pretty much the most in the state. Um, and I was out with guys like Kyler Murray and all those guys. And um, and so my grandmother, she would always come up to me after every game. Like, I just scored four touchdowns, went crazy in the game. And she said, hey, preacher, good job. I'm like, Granny, like, <laughs> like, what are you, what you talking about? From, grandma? Yeah, you, you know what's about? interesting? Yeah. Because I, I remember I was joking about being a grandma with um, uh, an audience. And one of the little old ladies came up to me and said, honey, that is not the role of grandmas. You're, you're just not going to spoil them. You're going to put jewels into them. You're going to have to put wisdom into them. Because at one point, they're going to hate their parents. Right. And you want them to come to you. She well, said, don't, don't you don't want them to go to your friends. You want them to come to you. <laughs> So it's interesting that here you had mm -hmm. 2016, mm -hmm. your wife says, that's it. I'm, I'm tired of this now because you're not doing right. Then 2017, God took your jewel. He took the, he took the insight, the wisdom. She's gone on to heaven, but she left some, some very important insight in you by calling you a little preacher, man. By 2018, I'm hearing you say you broke your foot. So now you're on your back. And so you have to think about that call on your life. Move us up to that moment that while in the midst of that moment, the next thing we know, we have a, a, a uproar in our society with all this racial tension and he led you to go down to the Black Lives Matters protest. The guy saw you from the stage, told you to come up here and yeah. the preach got on. Yeah, that was <laughs> the preach got on. Yeah, that, that was probably the just the craziest part. Um uh, just about my call uh to ministry. Um I was training for the draft this time last year and uh obviously COVID hit and so everything changed, you know, for me. Uh, got a call from the Chargers and the Colts. They were talking about signing me. I'm over here making breakfast for my, for my wife, and I get a call from an L.A. number. And then they leave a message, hey, this is so-and-so with the L.A. Chargers. I drop the food. I'm just like, oh, hey, they, baby, the Chargers are calling. And uh, that fell through. It, it didn't happen for me. And so to me, I was just asking God, like, why would you dangle an opportunity in front of my face if, if, if it's not going to – you're not going to give it to me. And I feel like he was just saying it's because I got something else for you. Mm -hmm. And and so fast forward, like Star said, during a time with uh, the George Floyd protests, Breonna Taylor, just everything that was going on around this kind of like this time last year in the spring, uh, that was crazy. And, and during that time when I was training for the draft, I was training with, with guys like Patrick Mahomes and Des Bryant. We were just so like, okay, surely this is what the Lord wants me to do. And um, I get a random call from a number and uh, left me a voicemail. And he said, hey, man, this is uh, so-and-so with a church in um, Arizona. We feel like uh, you have a call to preach, man. We feel like you're gifted. And I'm just like, y'all hey, got the wrong guy. Like, this is the wrong number. And, um, man, fast forward through that time, uh, we had a protest in downtown Fort Worth uh, with George Floyd. And I've never been to a protest before, ever. Um, but I just saw people um, – Grieving. Because you said another, you got another call though, a yeah. random call. So after you got the call about mm -hmm. the, from the person that said you called to preach, yeah. then you get a call to go to this protest. Yeah, yeah. So you're like, I've never done this before, but right. I'm going to go. Yeah, so go yeah. So that. I went, and on my way to the protest, uh, it was two uh, sisters I ran track with in Alito. I call them sisters. Um, and uh, they just called me and said, hey, Ryan, we want you to come to this protest. And I'm just like, wait, what? Why? And so during that time, I went. I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm going to go to this protest to see what it's about. And, and we went. And um, <laughs> we got down to uh, downtown Fort Worth, and I was on my way driving there. I was like, Lord, if I could just touch one person um, and share the gospel to them, I'll be fine. Like, 
that'll be cool. I can go home. You know, we'll be all right. And uh, I didn't know what the Lord had for me in store. But you also didn't know, if I remember you, what you were saying, is you didn't know how politicized it was. Yeah. You didn't know who the organization was and what their real agenda was. Yeah. You I, just were walking into this blind moment yeah, of yeah. Black Lives Matters. But on your way, yeah. you're asking him, show me your hand. Right. So go ahead. Yeah. Now you get there. Yeah, I get and there. And spotted you out of the crowd. Yeah, it, it was crazy. I got there and, and we were marching and we used to kneel on every corner. So we know every corner and the guy speaking um, for the protest was just like, if anybody wants to say something, now would be a good time. We would kneel, moment of silence, and then we march. So we marched to the courthouse. And every time we kneeled on every block, I would sit there and my heart starts racing. And I'm just like, man, what's going on, man? Like, why is my heart racing? And I knew it was the Lord. And he was telling me to speak. And I was just like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Um <laughs> And I didn't want to be like Jonah either. I was like, yeah. oh, I forgot to tell y'all out there. Yeah, it's another live audience here at NRB. So it's yeah. not like a laugh track or anything yeah, like this. We're, we're into this story. Yeah, and so for, for me, I, I, I got there, and uh, we, get, we get to the courthouse. And it's, it's a lot of steps. And uh, we finally get there, and I said, I just closed my eyes. I said, okay, Lord, if you really want me to speak, then just clear a path for me. And you guys, I, I can't describe it to y'all what happened i grew up in a pentecostal church so i'm just i'm just like okay and i prayed the prayer and, and i just opened my eyes and people literally start moving and i'm just like why are they moving like where are they going and uh they cleared a path for me and so i i can't describe it to you guys till this day but i just walk up the steps and uh the organizer of the black lives matter protest was there and he just looked at me and he just gave me the microphone. And I was like, he's like, you want to say something? I was like, dang, God, like that quick? <laughs> like, okay, be careful what I pray for. Yeah. Uh, and so, lo and behold, he, he gives me the phone or the microphone and uh, it's CNN there, they're NBC, they're just all there and the camera's in front of my face. And I just, I'm asking the Lord, like, how did I get here? And um, I, he gives me the microphone and I, and I just tell people, it's, it's probably north of like 8,000 people there. And so I go for one, and he puts me in front of 8,000. And so that was just crazy in and of itself. But when I spoke, I just saw malice. I, I saw um, uh, anger. I, I saw uh, resentment, hurt. And I just wanted to go there simply to lament with people. And when I got to speak, yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't mean to interrupt, but you said yeah. before you saw the malice and the hate mm -hmm. as you were moving through the crowd to mm -hmm. go back to find your yeah. wife. You saw what God was doing. Oh, he, yeah. You saw those that were weeping. You saw those yeah, that didn't yeah. know why they were there either, that right. they were looking for truth. Yeah. And he kind of confirmed that to you first. I yeah. remember you telling me about a young man that first you, he caught your eye yeah. and you caught his. Yeah, it, it, I was up there. And when I spoke, I just basically told people that, you know, the gospel in and of itself is, is sufficient enough to reconcile our differences. Um, the, the blood of Christ, is, it's, just, it's just that. It's not the blood of Christ and something else. Um, and so there's power in, in Jesus' name, obviously. Um, and, and the one thing I, I know is that, man, with him, there's nothing that we cannot do in him. But outside of him, we can't accomplish anything at all. Uh, and so even our protest or what we say or no justice, no peace, it's, it's all vanity if it's not in Christ. And so it's futility. And so I, I had that in mind. And I basically, when I spoke, I, I said what I said. And, and uh, it was a standing ovation. And uh, so I was just excited. My blood was pumping. And as I go down the steps, uh, there was a woman um, and she was crying. And she just grabbed me. And I was like, uh oh, here we go. <laughs> and she grabbed me. And uh, it looked like she had a brother there. And she was crying. She said, uh, Man of God, I just was praying that a black man would come out here and tell these people about the one thing that could change everything, uh, and that was Jesus. And she said, could you speak a few words to my brother? And I said, he was 17, and I said, little bro, um, about six years from now, I was 23 at the time, you're going to be fighting the same fight that we're fighting right now. So, so don't get it twisted, man. We're going to be here battling, but I just want you to know, man, that there is a person that transcends the most tumultuous of circumstances, and his name is Jesus. And so when I got through the crowd after talking to him, I gave him a hug, and there was clapping, and then for some reason, 
the ovation stopped when I got to the back of the crowd and it everything just turned dark and so uh, it went from like Jesus is not real to, to Jesus as a woman to Jesus is is gay just it's everything right and so I feel like God was doing a couple things with me in that moment I feel like one he was confirming my call to ministry and at the same time he was introducing me to the battle that's ahead and so when I went through the crowd uh, I got I got scared I got scared I was just like yo what's going on like Lord this is not what I signed up for and the thing we is just have to hear a whole lot more about what you signed up for with the Lord because <laughs> of one problem that we have is a time clock oh, man. and I've gotten the signal a couple of times yeah and but I think that Ryan Newsom to be introduced to you like mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. I am sure that many that are watching yeah. on television right now and the internet right now many that are in this room are going to want to hear so much more about your story yeah. and so we're so glad that you're a part of cure and yeah. that you've met Reverend Tim to be a part of our network mm -hmm. because it is really important mm -hmm. that they see wait a minute what and then you launch that ministry yeah. and the next thing you know you're standing in Alito in front of that school board mm -hmm. to say thus saith the Lord that as you mentioned a moment ago this racial tension amongst us yeah. there's only one healer you want to pray to end yeah. racism then those that have that tendency in their heart the same way people that have gossip tendencies in their heart have to get before the Lord themselves this mm -hmm. country is not systemically racist we're talking about now yeah. sin yeah. and the nature of sin and it's individual and unique as we are yeah. so I want to just thank you for being here with us yeah. or for sharing your wife with us and now you got a little new baby with us so yeah. I'm gonna have to bring Ryan back obviously because I know you want to hear more <laughs> <laughs> okay. there are so many more details yeah. uh, that are in this story yeah. But I'm going to have to uh, move on. We're here at NRB. We have so much things that we're doing already. We have so many meetings that we have to attend. And uh, I will get right back with you with another pastor uh, in our network after this important message. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Uh, we've got a new year in front of us, 2021, and uh, new opportunities. But for many, we've got the same old problem. There's that emptiness in your heart. And you've been trying to fill it with drugs and alcohol and sex and everything else, but it just doesn't work. Uh, you've been searching, but you don't even know what you're searching for. God is the only one who can fill that vacuum. If you've never trusted his son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior, uh, do that today. You see, Jesus took our sins. He died on the cross. He was buried, and God raised him to life. And he can come into your heart and change you and forgive you. Just pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe Jesus is your son and I want to trust him today as my savior. I want to invite him to come into my life and take control. If you prayed that prayer, call that number that's on the screen. Do it right now, call that number. Someone's willing to speak with you right now. Call that number. God bless. It's time for a cure. Cure is a coalition of new voices with new ideas that will become new policies. We are the cure. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education, headquartered in Washington, D.C., CURE works with churches, political, and business leaders on behalf of urban communities. CURE's mission is to address issues of culture, race, and poverty from a Judeo-Christian perspective. CURE, join with us. There has never been a better time to help black communities. Let's take a quick history lesson. Just two centuries ago, 94% of the people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's eight and a half percent. In a century, our life expectancy is more than doubled. How did we come so far so fast? The freedom to create, to start a business, to keep what you earn. Don't let the socialists and radical left cost us our progress, our freedom, and our well-being. It's time we fight for America and vote for America. Well, here we are, Cure America with Star Parker. That's me at NRB, the National Religious Broadcasters. This is the final day that we're here in the Dallas area in a city called Grapevine. It's been amazing. I've got my cowgirl boots on. I've been wearing them every day through the halls. And there are thousands of people here that are the Christian communicators from all across the world. And we've just had an exciting time. And I wanted to bring a little bit of it to you, in particular our pastors, because we have many of them that are here to learn, to grow, as I've told you earlier earlier. You've met a couple of them already. And now the final session with Mark Little, Re uh, Reverend Little, actually Pastor Little, uh, Umbrellas, the um, uh, No Longer Bound ministry in 
uh, California in Los Angeles. And Mark is um, just amazing. And Tegra and the work that they do to save babies' lives that are still growing in the womb, uh, as well as he's an attorney, <laughs> he is an author, uh, he's our board chairman, uh, it heads up an organization now. And so we're just very excited about having you here, Mark, because I've got some things I really need to discuss with you about race and why every time we talk about race now, it turns to rage. What is going on with this critical race theory that left the academic world that's now in the high schools and people all over the country having to fight it. Some are even getting arrested just by telling their school board members that they don't want this there. Um, racial reconciliation was what we were talking about just 10 years ago. Thank you for joining me. And I just want to let you share what should we be thinking about on these very, very critical topics. Thank you, Star. Good morning. It's good to be here with you all here at NRB. Uh, you're right. Um, this conversation about race that's now turned into rage uh, that is uh, popping up across the country, the opposition to it, mostly by parents in schools now. Uh, but I'm here to talk to the pastors because if the pastors don't understand critical race theory, then we have a real, real problem because it's a, a Trojan horse that's packaged as an issue about race. And it really isn't about race. And critical race theory is unbiblical. So what critical race theory does, contrary to uh, the Bible and to Christian teaching, that says we're all created equal under God and made in his image, critical race theory says that we're going to come against power structures and we're going to divide humanity in two categories, between the oppressor and the oppressed. And to be an oppressor, you just have to be white, heterosexual, male, cisgendered, able-bodied, Native American, and native born rather. Everybody else is in the oppressed category. And what's interesting about that is that through intersectionality, which became uh, prominent in 1989 through Kimberly Crenshaw, you are measured, your, your degree of oppression is measured by whether you are black, uh, whether you're uh, transgender, whether you're LGBT, whether you're, in the more of those categories and boxes that you checked, the more oppressed you are. But now here's the problem. Here's the problem. Uh, the more oppressed you are, the least responsibility you have. The more oppressed you are, the more moral authority you have under critical race theory. Now the second part, that's about humanity and the view that critical race theory has of humanity. It also has a view of sin. And if you are the oppressor, you're the one with sin. The oppressed you know, I are not see, with sin. That because that you're, you're absolutely right. It's almost like the, the sin of racism, which it is, is now elevated status, that it's like all other sins don't even matter anymore. So go ahead, I'm interested in this point that you're making there. Uh, and so in, in, uh, we, we believe that through Jesus Christ and repentance, we have salvation. With critical race theory, you as the oppressor have to surrender your privilege. That's what we call woke. And it's done through activism right here, right now. For us, our hope is in eternity. But now who are you surrendering to? You're surrendering to government so that they can redistribute or are you surrendering? I mean, my goodness, some of these corporations are being shaken down in the hundreds of thousands, some of in the millions. And I think B of A put a billion dollars on the table to say, please leave us alone. Uh, so where is this money even going to support this worldview that some of us know is in Marxism? Well, I think you just answered it. So uh, it, it, this, this derives out of an economic system. Uh, we call it cultural Marxism, uh, critical theory, all out of Marx and Engel, out of the Frankfurt School in Germany. That's all based on an economic system. And so critical theory uh, then begins to uh, uh, criticize thought, Western thought. But ultimately, the goal was to have, a co have communism. And so what we're seeing now uh, in response to what is not about race, I keep saying, you, uh, saying that to you as pastors, uh, because critical race theory has is, is infiltrated the church, and so many in the church have grabbed hold to it because they believe it's a conversation 
about race. Right, and because it, we, saw, we, we, we saw many of the churches that we highly regard their pastors marching with BLM. They were they're adopting this idea of critical race theory. They're having sessions on social justice. It's all interrelated. Why is it that they don't see that it's rooted in, in a worldview that is attached to Satan? Why can't they see that every communist country has no God in it? We don't, they, we, they don't allow to worship. They're, they're atheists. What, what's going on with that pastor that they can't see this? I, it's a great question. And I talk to my friends who are pastors all the time. And the black pastors, particularly in the evangelical space, uh, they struggle with acceptance within the white evangelical church. And, and what they say to me is, this is the only vehicle we have to talk about race. But why do they and need I, to talk about yeah, race? Yeah, because, because they feel... Uh, Historically, they feel uh, that race is still an issue in America. They feel that there's systemic racism in America. They don't, they don't understand the, the concept that systemic racism see? doesn't exist it in doesn't the way exist, they It doesn't exist, but they're it. bringing it. Because what's happening now is, it used to be, in, even in my own life, traveling, I get on an airplane and I'm just like all other passengers. Now you get on an airplane and the white steward has a Black Lives Matters and now thinks he's obligated to say something to me. I don't understand now how I walk into a room and all of a sudden I'm black. And I'm just like, as if that tells them everything they know about me. Look, I don't mind what God has done through my ethnicity. And my life's experiences have added to a dimension that I really love sharing with my friends and my family and others that I know. But this box that you talked about is an assumption that all blacks are exactly the same and our experiences are the same. And that's offensive. So what do we do to have the pastors recognize that they're in a line of error and they're leading their congregations astray and it's widening the racial gaps to where now people are totally confused. They don't even know how to approach their regular friends that they've known for years uh, anymore because that friend just happens to be ethnic. I want to respond in two ways. First of all, please understand that this is a trick of Satan. That's at the root of it. Uh, to destroy the greatest nation that God ever allowed to be created. Where anyone of any ethnicity, any experiences can come and be saved and can, and can build a life in this country. This is horrible what's going on, but go ahead. And, and there's more migration of Africans and others to this country uh, than, than in any other place in the world. Everyone wants to be here for a reason because it remains the land, the home of the brave and the land of the free. Uh, and so, uh, but the reality is, Star, is that race, the construct of race, that ra ra we are of one blood. We're of one blood. God said, I created man in my image, in our image, the image of God. We're his image bearers. There, there is not, there, there's Jew and Gentile, but there, there is not a separation uh, in the way that this is talking about. So it's a trick, it's anti-God. You, you mentioned Marxism, ultimately communism. These are anti-God systems. And so the church has to understand the historical uh, genesis of this. And it has everything to do with coming against the church. And so as you promote it, you must understand what you're promoting. You're promoting division that is anti-God. This, this is Marxism that ultimately David Horowitz told me, Mark, stop calling it Marxism. He said it's communism. It's, well, Marx, it, Marx's philosophy was rooted um, in uh, his own ideas, the same way we have Christianity as a worldview, but the system of the society here would be capitalism, there would be communism. And so I think that that's the difference between the two, because you're right, Marx, in Marxism in and of itself is not a system of right, government, right, yeah. but the system of government that's complementary to it is communism. It's no need of us even calling it socialism because it's not at all. When government owns and does everything, we had that conversation yesterday a little bit, well, for you guys that are watching, you had it right now, like <laughs> before the break, um, about how um, the, the um, it, oh, what was I thinking about? Um, Ah, I lost my train of thought because I'm thinking about you, but, but <laughs> we were thinking about yesterday. Um, oh, the policing, 
The question of policing yesterday came up, which for the audience just came up because it, right before the break. But on policing, uh, how is it that you're going to destroy and get rid of all police? And it's not that they want to get rid of it. They want a military army the same way that we see in these communist countries. Can you speak into that? Because it's related to it this is. critical race theory and the and the Black Lives Matters movement. And and I'll go a step further. Of course, of course, uh, that that is one of the paths. One of the things that they need ultimately to accomplish their goals. But let's not forget about the attack against the family. Uh, the attack, the a whole LGBT attack against the family that takes men out of the home, which of course has been happening in America since the New Deal. And so men are out of the home. Now they've got to move against guns. And they're very serious about it. So when you talk about defunding the police, as you said yesterday, they don't want to get rid of the police. They want to control all 18,000 districts across the country. Uh, they want to take and confiscate guns, and if they can't confiscate them, they'll tax them to the point where you can't afford to have one. What do we do? Because we're, you know, people are probably afraid now. Many are now uh, turning off because they're saying, okay, well, God's going to come back anyway, uh, so I just need to put my head down and just hope that it's tomorrow. Yeah. How, uh, what, can, yeah. <laughs> what can we do? I mean, I was having a conversation a minute ago that, oh, because earlier we talked to uh, uh, Pastor LaFleur, let's pull our kids out of the schools. Let's get, let's rescue them. Let's train up another generation uh, that they can uh, th that they can learn and grow and, and and live free. Then we heard how God is still moving in Pastor uh, Ryan. What can what do we do? What can we do? Uh, the, the first response star for the pastors is that you've got to go into Matthew five, chapter thirteen, and you must be salt and light. A, a lot of people say. Uh, to me, Pastor, why should I do anything? This thing, it's, it, it's already a train out of the station, and they're just waiting for the Lord to come back. Or that, right, or that it's already prophesied in Scripture that That's it's going right. to happen, so we're not going to stop right. it anyway, yeah. so why are we but, the, but there's no expiration in your identity, which is to be salt and light. And light must shine darkness into the culture until he returns. Salt must preserve the culture for his return. There's no expiration, Matthew 5 and 13. And so what does that look like in your community and in your church? Uh, perhaps it's the school board. Perhaps you need to start a political action ministry and put people in office. That's a response. Perhaps you need to show up at the school board meetings and make sure that they are not doing critical race theory. And it's disguised as ethnic Or start their studies. own school, because you know, yeah. I know that um, you know, there are many pastors that are probably listening and, and there are congregations that are listening where the pastor won't say anything about the cultural war that we're in, so then it leaves the folks just to kind of figure it out when they go into the polling booth, and then they find out later that they have totally voted against their values. What happened last November in this country is unacceptable for Christians. We now have an aggressive administration, a Biden administration, that is just going to tear Christianity apart. They're voting now on the Equality Act. This is nuts. And yet, with the society, we're not prepared uh, because of the pastors. So I want you to speak beyond them being salt and life and maybe give them a word that they, they, they better look at the bottom side of that. Uh, you know, have you ever been to Vatican? Remember, it used to be covered. You couldn't see the bottom of what Michelangelo did. It's people going to hell. <laughs> that's, what it, that's what's there. It's like, and they, you're going to go downward if you don't do this right. We only have a minute. You got to tell not just the pastor, but what should the congregant do? What should the congregant do who's sitting there and they know that their pastor is just avoiding all of these precious issues that uh, to, to preserve for our grandchildren? Star, uh, that is the quintessential question. And, and the response is, is that we first need to understand and deposit and be rooted in what we stand for, what the Bible stands for, what, what it says. You have to be rooted in biblical truth. And then you must avoid the lie that there's a separation between church and state. There is no such thing. It's not constitutional. And, and, and with that, understand that your faith must be married with your vote. You can't separate the two. The Johnson Amendment has lied to you and said that you as pastors can't speak. You haven't lost your First Amendment right. I find that that one is more uh, an issue in the in the white community than the black community. Black churches always speak on political issues. I just find that they speak for the devil. Uh, many of them are speaking that uh, from this race 
perspective. They're putting their color in front of Christ. And so then they allow their congregants to go out. There is no reason for Georgia to have be, be now on the chopping block to say, are we going to be able to keep biblical truth alive in that state? Now they're in Texas, what we just heard, what they're doing there uh, from, from Ryan. So I want to I want you to speak to the people because we only have one minute. I want you to tell them that they need, probably need, I, I'm gonna tell you what I want you to tell them. Get up out of, <laughs> get up out of that church. Get up out of that church and go to a church where the pastor believes the word of God. Well, you, you, you said it, <laughs> you said it. You know, uh, as, as a pastor and as one who has is, who is run, a, run a large church for many, many years, um, our churches are divided. Uh, because our pastors, um, they understand that not everybody is monolithic in their church. Uh, and, so, and so they don't talk about the hard issues. Uh, the, the reality is, is that if you're in the church, you have a responsibility beyond what's happening and what's being said in the pulpit. You have a responsibility to yourself, to your family, and to your community to be informed. Because sometimes a hard truth gets people saved. I mean, a dear friend who, when her pastor got up one day and said, you know, I've never mentioned abortion over the pulpit, but I've got to. I found out some information. I've got to do it. He said, I know some of you in my biggest tithers might leave. And when he saw her get up out of that room, he was like, oh, no. But she went out of the room the week before God and to get healed. And now she runs an incredible ministry for yeah. those that are mm -hmm. struggling through um, pro-life. So I... Let me, let me say this. You've sir. got to tell them let, they got to speak the this. truth. Yeah. We're going to die as a country if yeah. we don't. And that's hurting people. It's Absolutely. hurting people. And, and the church is, is the answer. And so I'd say to pastors all the time, I said, you, you believe that by uh, staying away from the hard issues, uh, that somehow you're safe. The reality is, is that your people are waiting for you to speak. And you, you by not speaking, are doing an, yourself a disservice and you're doing them a disservice. And, and, and by the way, uh, that is a problem with your calling. Because where there's no vision, the people perish. And communities are crumbling because pastors are refusing to speak the truth. And so my admonishment is to the pastors because you have a responsibility. You're the under shepherd. And if you lay down on your job, you're responsible for what's happening in your congregation. Amen. That's right. Amen. It's a wrap. <laughs> I'm going to see you next week here on Cure America with Star Parker. Go share with a friend and give this one to your pastor. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Uh, we've got a new year in front of us, 2021, and, and new opportunities. But for many, we've got the same old problem. There's that emptiness in your heart, and you've been trying to fill it with drugs and alcohol and sex and everything else, but it just doesn't work. Uh, you've been searching, but you don't even know what you're searching for. God is the only one who can fill that vacuum. If you've never trusted his son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior, uh, do that today. You see, Jesus took our sins. He died on the cross. He was buried and God raised him to life. And he can come into your heart and change you and forgive you. Just pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I believe Jesus is your son and I want to trust him today as my Savior. I want to invite him to come into my life and take control. If you prayed that prayer, call that number that's on the screen. Do it right now. Call that number. Someone's willing to speak with you right now. Call that number. God bless.